quick revision video for the halogens topic and please be sure to like and subscribe for new content. Okay, so we'll start off with the physical properties of the halogens. So halogens occur as diatomic molecules, so F2Cl2, etc. In the solid state, they form simple covalent lattices. Their boiling and melting points increase down the group. So there's a summary table of all the halogen molecules with their total number of electrons in the diatomic molecule. You can see the boiling points are increasing and the appearance at room temperature and pressure. So fluorines are pale yellow gas, uh, chlorines are pale green gas, bromines are red brown liquid and iodine is a shiny grey black solid. So we'll just quickly explain that. So if we think about the lattice, the, so we'll be talking about the melting point here. So to break the um, lattice down, we've got to overcome the intermolecular forces, the induced dipole-dipole forces between the molecules. And as the number of electrons in the molecules increases, these intermolecular forces get stronger. Just remember that we're not breaking the covalent bond between the atoms in the molecule. It's the induced dipole-dipole forces, or London forces, you could call them. So if we move on to the chemical properties of the halogens now, they all have seven valence electrons. So their configuration is S2P5 in the outer shell. They all accept one electron to become a one minus halide ion. So fluorine becomes fluoride, F minus and so on. Since the halogens are electron acceptors, they are classed as oxidizing agents. So they cause other substances to lose electrons. The oxidizing power, their ability to accept an electron, decreases down the group. And that's due to the increasing atomic radius of the atom, the increased amount of shielding, they've got more shells, and therefore the attraction from the nucleus to the electron that's been attracted in gets weaker. And this trend in oxidizing power is demonstrated by the halogen halide displacement reactions, which we'll look at on the next slide. So the procedure for these reactions is as follows. A solution of a halogen is added to a solution of a halide ion. If the halogen is more reactive, it's going to displace the less reactive halide. And the colour of the test tube at the end of the reaction indicates which halogen is present. Now, the colours of the halogens aren't very sort of distinguishable from each other in aqueous conditions. And so what we do is we add a small amount of organic solvent to um, make the halogen much more easy to identify. So I'll show you an example of that now. So chlorine with KBr. So chlorine's more reactive, so it will displace the bromine. So that's the full equation for that reaction. There's the ionic equation for the same reaction, and it's a redox reaction. Just quickly explain that. Chlorine starts out its oxidation state zero as the element goes to negative one. So that's a reduction process. And the bromine starts out with oxidation number minus one in Br minus, and it goes up, it increases to zero. So that's an oxidation process. So we've got a reduction and an oxidation process happening in the same reaction, hence redox. Got this little cartoon here just to illustrate what's happening. So there's your more reactive halogen. So chlorine in this case is two chlorine atoms covalently bonded together. There's your two separate bromide ions and that ice cream is meant to represent the electron. So because chlorine is more reactive, it's got a smaller atomic radius, less shielding, greater attraction for the electron, it's going to pull the electron off the bromide ion and the chlorine atoms will become chloride ions. And you'll end up with two separate bromine atoms which then just covalently bond and form the diatomic bromine molecule. So what would that look like in a test tube? So you've got the bromine, the displaced bromine, in that aqueous layer at the bottom of the test tube there. Um, it's sort of a very pale yellow, but if you add some cyclohexane and organic solvent, it will um, the bromine dissolves much better in that layer, and you see its colour more intensely. So you get that um, orange layer there for the bromine. So we'll just look at the colours of all of the halogens in water and the organic solvent. So there's a photo of all three. So I'll just go through from left to right. So chlorine, there's this test tube here. It's very, very pale green in both uh, layers. 
aqueous is the lower layer, organic solvent is the upper layer. It often looks colourless because it's so pale green. We've just seen that one in that example, so that's your bromine, which is yellow in water and orange in the organic solvent. And this one here is the iodine, which is sort of a pale brown colour in aqueous or water conditions, and violet in the organic solvent. So on this slide we'll look at the uses of chlorine. So the first use is its um, addition to drinking water to kill harmful bacteria, e.g. the bacteria that would cause cholera. So the equation for that reaction looks like this, CO2 plus H2O gives HCl and HClO. The bacteria is killed by the chlorate one ion, the ClO minus ion here in this, this is called chloric one acid, and that is the ion that kills the bacteria. The other reaction is the production of bleach, so that's when chlorine is reacted with cold dilute sodium hydroxide. So there's the equation there. So you can see it's quite similar. We get, instead of HCl, we get NaCl. Instead of HClO, we get NaClO. And we also get water. The bleach is this chemical here, sodium chlorate 1. And you'll see it also contains that chlorate 1 ion. These are both examples of disproportionation reactions because the chlorine is oxidized and reduced. So we'll just use this one to illustrate that. Chlorine starts out at zero in the element. It goes to negative one in HCl. So that's a reduction process. It's a drop in the oxidation number. In here, it's plus one. The oxygen's negative two, hydrogen's plus one. So the chlorine needs to be plus one to keep this overall neutral. We'll just look at some arguments for and against the chlorination of water now. So arguments for things like, well, it kills harmful bacteria. So obviously that's going to reduce the risk of waterborne diseases such as cholera. So it's got massive public health benefits. It prevents the formation of algae in water. It eliminates bad tastes and bad smells in water. And finally, it persists, the chlorine persists in the water. So it has a longer lasting effect compared to alternatives such as the addition of ozone or UV to the water. Some arguments against chlorination of water now. So chlorine is toxic. It's also a respiratory irritant. Chlorine reacts with organic matter that's in the water and that can form chlorinated hydrocarbons. And the problem with those is they are carcinogens or cancer-causing chemicals. And another argument against is just that some people are against government intervention. So the final aspect we're looking at now is the test for the aqueous halide ions. So I'll run through the procedure first and then show you the um, observations, got some photos of the results. So when silver nitrate is added to a solution that contains a halide ion, so it could be um, chloride ions, bromide ions, iodide ions, you get a silver halide precipitate. These silver halide precipitates have different colours, and they also have different solubilities in aqueous ammonia. So we'll just run through the procedure now for the test for a halide ion. I'm going to use chloride ions to illustrate this, but it's the same procedure for all of them. So you take your test tube containing your aqueous halide ions or chloride ions in this case. And the first thing you do is add a small amount of dilute nitric acid. And the purpose of that is to remove any carbonate ions that might be present. So if you've got carbonate ions present, they will react with the silver ions from the silver nitrate and give a precipitate of silver carbonate. So you'd get a precipitate, and you would think it was um, a silver halide, but it's actually silver carbonate. So it's, it's giving you a false positive result. Once you've got rid of the carbonate ions, you would add a small amount of silver nitrate solution, and you'd observe the color of the silver halide precipitate. So silver chloride in this case is white. You'd then add a small amount of dilute aqueous ammonia to the precipitate and silver chloride actually fully dissolves in dilute aqueous ammonia. So that white precipitate would disappear and you just have a colorless solution left at the end of that process. So the ion equation for the reaction looks like that. So the silver ions, the aqueous silver ions from the silver nitrate solution combine with the aqueous chloride ions and give that solid silver chloride precipitate. 
So because we're getting a precipitate in this reaction, it's called a precipitation reaction. So I'll just do a summary of, of all the halide ion tests now, because obviously that previous slide just dealt with chloride. So we've got this table here. So this is what we've just observed. So chloride ions, there's the ion equation, there's the color of the precipitate, and there's its solubility in aqueous ammonia. So if we move on to the bromide ion now, same looking um, ion equation, the precipitate is cream, and that's partially soluble in dilute aqueous ammonia, but it's fully soluble in concentrated aqueous ammonia. And then finally, the iodide ion equation looks like that. It's a yellow precipitate, silver iodide's yellow solid, and that's insoluble in both types of aqueous ammonia. So I'll just show you this photo here. So this test tube here is actually silver chloride. This one here is slightly creamier color, that's silver bromide. And this one here is silver iodide. So the great thing about the solubility in the aqueous ammonia, it enables you to distinguish between, certainly between those two, because they are very, very similar colors. So if you, let's say you had this test tube as your result, and you can't decide whether it's white or cream. If you add a dilute aqueous ammonia to that and it dissolved, that's confirmation that it is um, the chloride. If it only partially dissolved, then you could say, well, it's not a chloride, so it's probably going to be a bromide because it's not very yellow color, but you could just then throw in some concentrated aqueous ammonia, and if it totally dissolved in the concentrated, you could say that it was bromide. Um, if it didn't dissolve at all in the concentrated, then you would be dealing with an iodide.